Hello, welcome to our overview of the major artistic and intellectual movements of the 19th century in Europe and the Americas, Romanticism, Realism, and Impressionism. We begin here with a brief look at Romanticism and Realism, outlining the prominent artists and stylistic features, as well as the dominant subject matter and thematic content of artworks, especially paintings, of the early to middle of the 19th century. What we have to understand is the political instability that looms large over the two stylistic movements. As we saw previously, the late 18th century brought significant upheavals of the absolute monarchy systems in the British colonies, with the creation of the independent United States of America, and in the Kingdom of France, with the creation of the Republic of France. This was only the beginning. As the 19th century unfolded, a series of uprisings and attempted political revolutions occurred, many of which developed around the year 1848, as identified by the red markings in our map here. After generations of repressive regimes headed by absolute monarchs, populations of citizens sought to overthrow these authoritarian systems and create societies characterized by more economic equality and political representation. Unfortunately, many of these uprisings failed and conservative political governments continued to rule. However, artists like many others were aware of these revolutions and used their artistic abilities to capture the revolutionary spirit and document the dramatic events of the times. There is not one subject or style that completely covers artworks that fall under the umbrella label of Romanticism. Instead, there are several thematic interests, technical approaches, and stylistic features that form the basis of Romanticism as an artistic movement of the 19th century. Like their counterparts in the fields of philosophy, literature, theater, music, and dance, visual artists sought to awaken and evoke the emotional impulses and reactions in viewers by their choices. They portrayed contemporary events that highlighted social injustice and the political efforts of revolutionaries across the American and European continents. They also portrayed the darker sides of human experience, focusing on the irrational and cruel, even nightmarish thoughts and activities that humans are capable of. While they continued many of the stylistic inventions characterizing art since the Renaissance, they also departed from the formation of accurate illusionism, electing instead to create images that focus the viewer's attention and emotions rather than fabricating a pleasing illusionistic space. We begin with the end of the Napoleonic Wars by looking at Goya's memory of the French invasion of Spain. Painted a few years after the invasion of 1808 and the subsequent installment of Napoleon's brother, Joseph Bonaparte, on the throne of Spain, Goya vividly recalls the bloodshed that took place during the swift and violent transition of power. Napoleon was supposedly granted access into Spain in order to reach Portugal, but once the French troops arrived in the capital of Madrid, they made their true intentions clear. On May 2nd, 1808, the people of Madrid rose up in protest of the French takeover and overthrow of the Spanish monarchy. Unsuccessful against the French military, this uprising was quashed, and those who participated were summarily rounded up and executed just outside the walls of Madrid. We see the city itself in the distance shrouded in darkness as the execution of the Spanish citizens at the hands of the French troops confronts us squarely in the foreground. Goya arranges this composition to create a series of cyclical directional lines, guiding us down the line of the French troops on the right side of the canvas, allowing us to see them acting in anonymous unison, then over to the left side of the canvas as we follow their guns. Pointing directly at a Spaniard shown in dramatic color contrast, shown in a white shirt, a color often associated with purity and surrender, with outstretched arms, reminiscent of Jesus on the cross, we can tell right away this figure in spotlight is the victim. 
he will soon join his dead townsmen, already executed, as the line of prisoners looks on in despair. Our eyes follow these lines back and forth across the canvas, forcing us to take in the brutality and violence over and over. One of the most iconic images of the Romantic movement is the painting Liberty Leading the People by Eugène Delacroix. Delacroix painted this work in just a few short months following the July 1830 revolution in Paris. After the fall of Napoleon, who attempted to form an empire following the French Revolution in the early 19th century, a restoration of the monarchy occurred, placing the younger brothers of the executed Louis XVI on the throne since the executed king's son died in captivity. With Louis XIX, excuse me, 18th, ruling from 1814 to 1824, and Charles X, ruling from 1824 to 1830. In an attempt to seize power after conflicts with the legislative branch of the government, Charles X proclaimed his ultimate powers in July 1830, and almost immediately the people rose up against him, rioting in the streets of Paris and eventually forcing the king's abdication. As a result, a new dynasty was established as Louis-Philippe I was placed on the throne with constraints that prevented him from serving as an absolute monarch. Known as the Citizen King, Louis-Philippe seemed to signal the start of a new contract between the people and their government, the constitutional monarch on the throne instead of an absolute one. In fact, Louis-Philippe Louis purchased this painting by Delacroix, commemorating the uprising that ended with him as king. Delacroix's composition creates a crowded and chaotic scene, with the allegorical figure of liberty herself prominently displayed in the center, leading the multitudes of rioters behind her. She holds the tricolor flag in her right hand, symbolizing the French nation she fights for, and is surrounded by young men of all different types from a soldier lying deceased at the bottom right, to a small boy brandishing pistols to the right, to the man at the left with an upper class top hat and coat. A humble factory worker looks up to her at her feet. She seems peaceful and calm in the midst of the brutal fighting, looking more like a statue of a Greek goddess than a peasant woman charging forward in the streets of Paris. We can tell this is Paris because of the faint outline of the towers of the Notre Dame Cathedral in the background, obscured by the smoke emitted from the armed clashes. Delacroix's palette is fairly muted, sticking to different versions of browns and tans, with important accents in red, white, and blue, mimicking the color of the French flag staggered throughout. As revolutions rocked the European continent throughout the mid-19th century, larger questions about social relations and institutions within states were being hotly debated. In the British and French countries and colonies, the institution of slavery was ended by the early 19th century. However, slavery still persisted in the United States. In 1840, the artist Joseph Mallard William Turner painted and exhibited this work called the slave ship, slavers throwing overboard the dead and dying, typhoon coming on. It throws us into the middle of the most frenetic part of the scene, as the ocean water churns dangerously, tossing the ship to and fro. Based upon the slave ship Zong, which hit ru such rough waters in 1781, Turner's painting shows how sick and dying slaves were thrown overboard in order for the captain to collect insurance money on his human cargo that was lost at sea. Although Turner gives us the subject matter clearly through the title, visually he makes us work for it. We are taken in by the gorgeous display of colors in the sky, with bright yellow, orange, and red of a sunset hovering in the distance. But our eyes follow the line created by the sun's rays. We encounter a gruesome scene in the waters nearest to us, where body limbs and shackles protrude out of the water as gulls swoop in for the taking. 
Turner reminds us of the horrific history we share as members of a civilized society, which for so long found it perfectly fine to maintain human slavery as a legal institution. The obvious devaluing of life is meant to sicken and shame us. Even though he depicts a subject from the past, it is no less apt for the 1840s, when the United States was in constant conflict over the admission of new states into the Union as either a place where slavery would remain legal or be abolished. Eventually, these conflicts would erupt into the American Civil War of the 1860s, when citizens succumbed to their more emo emotional and destructive impulses. Realism is a term used to describe a particular trend in art throughout the second half of the 19th century. Like Romanticism, it utilized recognizable experiences from modern life as its subject matter, though it portrayed these experiences as well as contemporary events in far less dramatic fashion. Meant to draw attention to the plight of average citizens in Europe and the Americas, and invoking specific thoughts and considerations in viewers. Artwork attributed to the realist tendencies were less interested in pulling on the emotional stirrings of viewers. Like romanticists, realist artists were less concerned with portraying convincing images of depth, an illusionistic perspective or proportion. Instead, they often made compressed scenes that forced the viewer to consider the subjects up close. We are going to look at two artists who were affiliated with realism, especially in France at this time. Helping to coin the term realism and establish a legitimate exhibition practice for its style, Gustave Courbet is almost synonymous with this artistic movement. Born in the small country town of Ornan, he traveled to Paris as a law student, but not long after turned to art full time. He studied the paintings of the Louvre, especially the old masters of the Baroque period, and he admired the works of the Romantic artists, such as Jericho and Delacroix. In the tumultuous year of 1848, Courbet had 10 works accepted to the Salon and received critical acclaim and even awards. However, before long, Courbet would cause a stir with his art, preferring to portray the less desirable aspects of modern life on his canvases. One such controversial work is shown here, called The Stonebreakers, which he painted in 1849. Though it may not seem to demonstrate offensive material to our eyes today, choosing to depict the struggles of peasant life as France was attempting to modernize and industrialize proved unfavorable to many critics. We see here two figures, both unfit for the backbreaking labor they are engaged in, with one far too young and the other far too old for such work. They are tasked with breaking stones in the hot sun, forced to help smooth the intended paths of the railroad that would soon cut through the French countryside, connecting Paris to the rest of civilized Europe. Yet, people like these two figures would likely never benefit from the arrival of the railroad, and if they could afford a ticket to travel, they would be forced to sit in the third-class carriage where other poorer citizens would be. Their clothes are clearly worn out and patched in many places, and a tired old pot holds what meager provisions they've probably had during this laborious day. They are close to us, compressed into the foreground, with little opportunity for our eyes to escape their plight and rest in the scenic details of the midground or background. Rather than demonstrating skillful modeling and chiaroscuro, Courbet allows harsher, darker lines to define the contours of their forms and surroundings. Unfortunately, this image is lost to us forever, destroyed in the bombing of Dresden that occurred at the end of World War II. Fortunately, though, Courbet was a prolific artist, and there are many examples of his honest depictions of what life for the working and peasant classes in France really looked like in the 19th century. In addition to Courbet, who found opportunities to exhibit his realist paintings outside the traditional salon schedule in Paris, 
The artist Edouard Manet also required new options for exhibiting his realist paintings. Rejected from the official Salon of 1863, the painting now known as Le Déjeuner Célèbre, or Luncheon on the Grass, was shown at the newly created Salon des Refusés, to the ridicule and scorn of many. Considered to be one of the masterpieces of the early modern era and a hallmark of realism, Manet's painting both referenced and rejected many elements of traditional painting in his composition. The group of men and women lounging in the countryside had been famous subjects for Renaissance artists such as Titian and Raphael. And certainly the female nude had been a frequent subject in works as goddesses, allegories, and the like. However, Manet's nude woman is seated among clothed men, and she appears too realistic in her posture, form, and especially in her knowing eye contact with the viewer, not with the men around her. This combination was too much for the Salon, since they could not pass her off as a mythological or allegorical figure, and accepting the reality of a nude woman in such circumstances offended their sensibilities and taste. Taste was important for the Salon as well, and Manet's style was just as offensive to the jury as the subject matter. Instead of using chiaroscuro to shape and model his figures, creating a more illusionistic transition between light and dark, Mana used actual lines in stark contrast between colors. He also neglected to follow the rules of linear and atmospheric perspective, making the space feel compressed and difficult to interpret. As the viewer's gaze moves back and forth to these individuals, the abandoned picnic and the scenery, they're left to answer their own questions without much help from the artist. Realism, then, does not mean that artists made their images look hyper-realistic. Instead, realism means that artists were borrowing their subjects from real life, preferring to give viewers a more honest take on social relations and human experiences in the 19th century over the mythological, religious, or historical scenes of the past. We continue by exploring a pivotal development that emerged in the late 19th century, Impressionism. This development greatly influenced the trajectory of modern art. Primarily dominant in France, this stylistic movement sought to capture the spirit of modern life as societies became more technologically advanced, cities became more crowded and dense, and national pride revolved around the powerful empires and colonial exploits of major countries like Britain, France, and the newly unified Germany. The European continent was ever more connected through the expansion of the railroad and the use of the telegraph, and life was increasingly organized around set working hours that offered opportunities for newfound leisure and disposable income as well. The Impressionists were a group of artists living and working in France in the late 19th century. They began exhibiting their works together in Paris outside the Salon system, beginning with the first exhibition in 1874 that was simply called the Anonymous Society of Painters, Sculptors, and Engravers. However, they quickly were dubbed Impressionists for giving viewers mere glimpses and impressions of scenes instead of the well-defined forms of traditional academic painting. Rather than favoring history painting or allegorical and mythological scenes, the Impressionists followed the example of the Romanticists and the Realists before them, preferring to paint scenes of everyday life in France and not worrying about making logically composed and illusionistic images. Their works are characterized by a sketchy style of quick brushstrokes, of putting rich and complementary colors side by side, and for emphasizing the play of light and shadow upon the world around us as our eyes truly perceive it rather than through the filter of precision and hyper-realism. One of the most recognizable images from that first Impressionist exhibition is Monet's work called Impression Sunrise, which helped give rise to the group's label. Rather than carefully blending the individual brushstrokes on the canvas surface, Monet allows the viewer to see the brushstrokes as he put them down, refusing to hide the evidence of his work. 
The viewer has to do just as much work here to interpret the image, as Monet really only leaves us shapes made from blobs of color that we have to turn into meaningful forms, from the water and the boats upon its surface to the bright orange sun rising over the large beams of the shipyard. This was a radical departure from previous styles, as even Courbet and Manet had given more definite line work to their forms. Instead, Monet lets us revel in the colors and allows the colors to exist in their own right, without the secondary application of just filling in the lines and other forms that were supposedly the elements that conveyed meaning in painting. Though derided by critics at the time, Monet's paintings have now become landmarks within the pantheon of modern painting for his pioneering handling of color and the depiction of light upon the components of our everyday world. A close friend of Monet, the artist Renoir, was one of the more commercially successful Impressionist artists during their careers. Renoir was equally fascinated with the play of light upon our surroundings and sought to capture the effect of light in a more obvious and authentic way than previous generations of artists, who created more subtle images where the light was perhaps taken for granted. Renoir was interested in the interactions of people, how they lived and spoke and gestured towards one another, how they spent their time away from work, and how they occupied the public and private spaces of life. Here we see a composition filled to the brim with people enjoying themselves at one of the outdoor beer and dance halls in late 19th century Paris, the Moulin de la Galette. At this point in time, even working class Parisians had leisure time and some spending money, and they took advantage of both to gather socially. Some of the men still sport top hats, characteristic of the upper class, but many men wear straw hats instead, more commonly worn by the lower classes. There is no one place where our eyes can rest in Renoir's painting. We may begin by engaging with the group directly in front of us, hoping to catch a snippet of their conversation, but then our eyes can glide around the canvas in the same way that the dancing couples glide around the dance floor, taking in the trees, lights, fashion, postures, and especially the colors of the scene before us. Renoir has covered this scene with a dappled effect where splotches of light seem to shine through an invisible canopy of trees. The loose brushwork, soft colors, and lack of hard lines all give a lightness to this scene, something much more pleasurable than the harsh features of the realist paintings before. Another Impressionist artist who was intrigued by human interaction was Edgar Degas, who spent most of his time depicting jockeys at the horse races and dancers at the ballet. He was curious about the awkward and surprising angles and shapes we make with our bodies, many times when we don't even think about it, and other times when we concentrate quite hard on it. Degas' Blue Dancers, shown here, reveals a quartet of ballerinas backstage stretching and adjusting their hair, tutus, and point shoes in front of a backdrop that seems to be painted with flowers and trees of an outdoor setting. Like Monet and Renoir, Degas decided not to create subtle and smooth transitions between colors, opting instead for splotches of color side by side in ways that don't obviously suggest three-dimensional volume and form. He did include hard lines, but just enough to make out the details of the dancers, instead of delineating the composition. Degas especially preferred to work in the medium of oils and pastels, which are sticks of pure pigment mixed with a sticky binder, allowing for a deeply saturated array of colors. Although this work is done with oil paint on canvas, it would be easy to mistake this for pastel as the colors are not blended together for an illusionistic effect, as oil paints often are. Pastels would have been an easier method for capturing the fleeting moments, lighting effects, and shapes of life, something the Impressionists were especially interested in. Degas forces us to consider the real work of the dancers, 
the more authentic moments of what being a ballet dancer actually entailed, rather than the polished performance intended for view for an appreciative audience. As the British art critic Valdemar Januszak once claimed, when you're viewing Impressionist paintings, the bravest and most wild are those by Berta Morisot. Morisot was an incredibly talented artist, and fortunately she exhibited her work alongside the other Impressionist artists and was considered an important member of the group. She married the brother of the painter Edouard Manet, Eugène, and gained access to the world of artists through her family connections. Most of all, she was unafraid of painting difficult scenes and tackling traditional challenges for oil painters. To accomplish this painting called Summer's Day, Morisot hired models to sit for her in the boat, hastily painting as the little rowboat rocked back and forth on the water. She was able to suggest depth and perspective with quick movements of her hand, with slashes of greens and blues, and minimal highlights of white, red, and brown to compose a believable outdoor space without the details inherent to atmospheric perspective as handed down since the Renaissance. She does not shy away from using a profusion of white paint right in the center of her canvas, something most painters would avoid for its difficulty in handling and blending. And she lets hurried zigzags suggest movement and volume instead of chiaroscuro. Morisot painted scenes of everyday life not succumbing to subjects that would have been sneered as simply sentimental or domestic, which were in fact the subjects mostly available to women artists at the time. Although there is no clear linear perspective here, our eyes are constantly drawn to the facial expression and intense gaze of the woman before us, provoking us to imagine her internal experience just as much as the exterior scene in the environment around her. Through both subject and style, Morisot captured the attention of her peers and continues to amaze art viewers today. This concludes our brief overview of Romanticism, Realism, and Impressionism from late 19th century France.